Hello and welcome from the First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, where we are going to be celebrating the third Sunday of Advent, a time of waiting and a time of preparation. Every year, I have an argument with the same person at church. And I would, as I said last week, when she came up to me and said, do we have to have the same argument this year? I said, yes, we do have to have the same argument this year. I knew what she was going to say. She knew what I was going to say. She was going to say, why don't we have the Christmas tree lit yet? And I was going to say, because it's not Christmas yet. And I know that the second that I turn my back, somebody other than her is not even going to argue. They're just going to quietly light the tree when I'm not around. And I'm not going to put it out. Oh, but don't tell anybody and pretend that this is not being said publicly. But the Advent wreath itself is a reflection of how long that discussion has been going on. Because you notice that there are three purple candles. Purple is the color that we usually use, or dark blue, during times of waiting and preparation, whether for Christmas during Advent or for Easter during Lent. And so the first Sunday and the second Sunday of Advent, we light purple candles. But the third Sunday of Advent, we light a pink one. In the Middle Ages, that tells you how far back this argument's been going. There were discussions about when it was okay to celebrate because it's not Christmas yet, but we know, we know what we're about. And so the third Sunday of Advent, they used to call some places, they still do, Gaudeta Sunday, from the Latin word that means rejoice. It's like when you tell a kid to wait at Christmas time, and we're all like that. You can wait a little bit, but you don't always wait like you should. You do your best. You make the Christmas cookies, but you know that one or two are going to disappear from the cooling rack. You tell the kids to wait to open their presents on Christmas morning, but there might be something in the stocking that they can open while everybody else is getting ready. So we have one more Sunday of Advent to go after this. And that'll be purple again. But even if we get ahead of ourselves a little bit, it's okay today. It's okay all the time. To rejoice in the Lord. Next Sunday, in church, in the in-person services, the choir is going to lead in a special cantata. And that will be a time of great joy. And we'll have beautiful music. Problem is that we won't be able to put it exactly in the same format on I'm not sure what the online format is going to be like next week. But by this time next week, I'll know. And by the time you see this next week, it'll all be there. And that's what Advent is like. We know what's coming. We have to make sure we're ready.
And we also have to be ready to be surprised. So for now, please join me as we worship the Lord. This week, our call to worship comes to us from Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2 to 4. It's a responsive reading, so please join in when you see the words that are in italics. Surely, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the well of salvation. And you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. We hear from someone who followed those words of Isaiah very well in his own life. The Apostle Paul who, when he was in prison, wrote these words to the church in Philippi when they had offered to send him something to help. He said, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need, for I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Our first hymn calls upon God to grant strength to his people in all things, as he has in the past. For it is through him and in Christ that we find strength and help in every time of need. Rejoice, rejoice. 
rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou root of Jesse's tree, an ensign of thy people be. Before the ruler silent fall, all peoples on thy mercy call. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Come, thou key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. The captives from their prison free and conquer death's deep misery. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou, day, spring, come and cheer our spirits by thy justice here. Dispel the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Peoples in one heart and mind. From dust thou brought us forth to life. Deliver us from earthly strife. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Shall come to the O This week we continue reading from Luke chapter three, where Luke describes the ministry of John the Baptist in preparation for the public ministry of Jesus. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, 
Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. Looking at the accounts of John the Baptist's ministry and his preaching, I picture him in some ways as uh, somebody who had put up with a lot of nonsense and finally just had enough. And to some degree, I can easily identify with that. I think most of us can. We may all disagree, for instance, about what exactly it is that's been getting under everyone's skin for the past several years. But I think we can all agree that so much has been going on for so long, whatever you think has been going on, that by now, Everybody is so on edge that it only takes a small thing to push them over the line. I got a glimpse into my own state of mind recently that I didn't like seeing. I had gone to uh, buy some candles, and it was at a pretty large store early in the morning. Not one that I normally go to, but I just happened to be nearby and thought, I need these things, let me stop there, see if they have them, and go from there. And uh, they had them, I picked them up, I went forward to the front at the register, and I found myself in one of those cattle chutes where they, they put merchandise that you don't need on both sides of you and try to funnel you through these displays so that they can call people one by one by one instead of having everyone lining up at different registers. And because it was early, I was the only one going through this, and there was only one cashier. She was way down at the other end when I got to the front of the, the, the maze. And she was doing whatever it was she was doing, straightening up hangers or um, putting paper in order, whatever it was, and she didn't know I was there. And I, you know, here we go. I didn't want to do the things that I might normally do to quietly say, excuse me, um, it would be <clears throat> cough, clear my throat, all that kind of stuff. Because right now, if you do that, it signals to people whether they are right near you or anywhere in your shot. Watch out for somebody. They might be sick. Maybe I'm overreacting. But the point is that everybody is sensitive about a lot of things. She didn't hear me making any noises. And she wasn't about to call me over. She didn't know I was there. So I just walked over to the register. And she was startled. She jumped. And she let me know that next time I should wait until I was called. Okay, fine. She rang my purchase up. And at the end of it, she asked if I had one of their customer cards. It was no, I didn't. Well, I would have saved 5% off today's purchase if I had had one. Oh, well, thank you. Would you like to apply for one? If you do, you can get 15% off your first purchase. No, thank you. I, I don't want a card. Well, that's your choice. Could she have my email address to send me my receipt? Uh, no. No. But it saves paper, and you'll have an opportunity to be notified of, of sales and savings opportunities throughout the year. No. I don't want any more What I really would like to do 
is to give you my money and to take my purchase and my change. That's all I really want to do. <laughs> okay. It was not a great interchange on the part of either of us. And after I went outside, I felt pretty guilty about it. Because despite everything, what she was doing was simply following the script that the company had given her and that she was probably required to follow. And I had just sort of made it worse. And I know I do that sometimes, but you know what? There are limits, aren't there? We all have our, our points where things just seem like total nonsense. Where things don't have to be quite like this now, do they? If I call the mechanics and want to make an appointment, and someone answers the phone. It's a great day at Smith's Auto. I've been known to say, is it really? It's just so artificial. It's so silly. For me, that gets on my nerves. And all of us, all of us right now, no matter what it is that has brought us to such a point, I think almost everybody is living on the edge of their last nerve a lot. And all it takes is one small thing. I don't know where your buttons would be for something like that. They may be something small. It might be uh, an email telling you that your $13 donation is needed to save the nation from total chaos. It might be something big, one more school shooting, one more school shooting, one more person killed unjustly and without reason, one more person who, who spews some falsehood that they have heard or read even if they mean well in saying it. No, enough is enough. One more time you go to the store and there's a shortage of coconut milk. Maybe that's all it takes. Whatever, whatever. Maybe even hearing somebody say, whatever. I have a feeling that John the Baptist, in his own mighty way, was addressing something similar. Similar, not identical, but similar. He lived in a time and a place where traditional ways of life very different from ours, but no less instinctual than the things that we, once upon a time, were used to. We're being violated left and right. We're altered. See, which word you use indicates something. But either way, things were shifting. And when times of change come around, 
and times of change are inevitable. People begin to ask these questions. Not all change is bad, and often change is necessary, but always significant change is stressful. And it can be worse, as it was in the time of John the Baptist. Because fluid situations can provide opportunity, and we, we see it in our own day, Fluid situations, providing opportunity for people whose motives and intentions are not exactly pure to give free reign to self-interest of all sorts. And one person's justifiable tax exemption is another person's intolerable loophole. And trust which normally is so important. It's always important. But it disappears when it is flagrantly abused. What doesn't disappear is the hurt, the regret, and the longing for something better whether you're looking back or you're looking forward, you know things don't have to be this way. And at such times, somebody may be heard as being truly prophetic because she or he has the gift and the courage to speak for a lot of other people who have just plain had enough, enough of the bad stuff and not enough of the good stuff. And the power in John the Baptist's message, as I hear it being recorded in Luke, is found in the way that it expresses a desire for just basic honesty, basic kindness, simple decency. A desire that has been shared with most human beings across history in his day and, I believe, in ours as well. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do otherwise, uh, must do likewise. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Hear this simple thing basic things, just normal, ordinary, do-your-job-fairly kind of things. Soldiers also came to him and asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations. Be satisfied with your wages. A desire for something normal, for a world that's understandable, that's just plain decent, kind, considerate. But how do you hold on in a world where those things seem to have gone away and you don't see all of them coming back in full force? anytime soon? The answer is that you yourself have to be ready to live in such a way that goes beyond simply meeting the requirements of doing what is right. Do that by all means. But we have to go further. And, and here I'm speaking to myself as much as to anybody else, because I know how badly I felt for that cashier after I left. Not in the moment. We, we, have to be prepared to let 
the kind of love that Jesus showed take over where the righteous indignation that John expressed leaves off. And, and don't be mistaken, John's indignation really was righteous and really was holy. And some of the things that we express may be totally on target. But to get beyond where we are, takes more. God bless anybody who, like John, is called to be part of the world's conscience. However, if they act out of anger or frustration, or if they act out of anything except love, they will simply be drawn into one fight after another. And probably those fights will be held with people who don't play by the rules. The rules that do touch our consciences. Willard Ashley, who is the first black dean of the New Brunswick Theological Seminary, writes that once you want to challenge the status quo, you're playing hardball with players who throw 100 per mile hour fastballs at your head in hopes that you are hit and injured. Nevertheless, he says, remember we have a spiritual core to keep us grounded, encouraged, supported, loved, and courageous. Those are very important things, you know. It's always going to have to be that spiritual core, the love that Jesus showed. The very love of the eternal God who made heaven and earth. That is what will need to shine through all of us. That's what anchors God's people, not in dismay at what is. Not in simply reacting to our own frustration or or reacting to the anger or trouble of others around us. But anchors us in the hope and the promise and the vision of what can be. So you had these people going to John the Baptist and asking him how they should live. And he tells them to be content with their just wages, not to be greedy, to be honest. But he tells them to do that in the awareness that there are going to be people who are greedy, who are dishonest, who do extort money. But don't you, he says, be one of them. And that calls for having a different set of standards, a different core, a different set of everything within our soul that lives out differently. Not in self-righteousness, but in recognizing that we're all the same. We're all in it together. To love our neighbors is to love ourselves. And to love our neighbor is to love God. And that takes an encounter with the risen Lord himself. 
It takes God through Christ and through the Holy Spirit dwelling within us and making a real difference in our lives, giving us a different light. And somebody who, like, say, the Apostle Paul, who had actually come face to face with the Lord, it takes someone like him to remind us of the difference that is possible. You know, he from prison, he could write to his friends in Philippi the words, I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We don't just opt out of the world's ways. We get taken out of them. Or maybe they get taken out of us. Either way, it's the work of the, the Holy Spirit, and it comes through our own encounter with the one who was born among us to transform us from children of earth into children of God. And it's an ongoing process. I thoroughly enjoy Barbara Robinson's story the best Christmas pageant ever. In it, a rough bunch of kids named Herdman start going to Sunday school because they hear from one of their classmates that sometimes they're sick too. And they show up at, at the Sunday school just in time because it's the Sunday when this Christmas pageant is being organized. And they decide that they want to be part of it. And not only do they want to be part of it, they decide that they want the best parts. And so they kind of intimidate and threaten and bully and push away anybody who's another potential Mary or Joseph or, or wise man that could get in their way. And then as the practice unfolds, they hear the story of Jesus' birth in its fullness. And they come to think about what it means for this baby in the manger. And for all the problems that they have, one thing they understand is how to take care of a baby. Because they've been left on their own enough they've had to do it. And so, as they hear about Jesus and what he needed when he was born, they start putting the pieces together. And they begin to express their reaction in ways that change how the rest of the kids come to understand all the familiar story. And not only the kids, but some adults, too. The narrator, who is one of the non-herdman Sunday school kids, tells the story how at one point, when the pageant finally came along, Everybody had turned to watch the wise men walk down the aisle, you know, singing We Three Kings of Orient are and all the usual stuff, the bathrobes and everything. But it was kind of unusual. And she says that they were carrying something. And whatever it was, she says, it was heavy. Leroy, 
one of the herd lambs, almost dropped it. He didn't have the frankincense jar either, and Claude and Ali, a couple of the others, didn't have anything, although they were supposed to bring the gold and the myrrh. I knew this would happen, Alice said, one of her friends, for the second time. I bet it's something awful. Like what? Like a burnt offering. You know the herdmans. Well, the narrator says, they did burn things, but they hadn't burned this yet. It was a ham. And right away, I knew where it came from. My father was on the church charitable works committee. They give away food baskets at Christmas. And this was the herdman's food basket ham. It still had the ribbon around it that said, Merry Christmas. I'll bet they stole that, Alice said. They did not. It came from their food basket. And if they want to give away their own ham, I guess they can do it. But even if the herdmans didn't like ham, and that was Alice's next idea. They had never before in their lives given anything away except lumps on the head. So you had to be impressed. Leroy dropped the ham in front of the manger. It looked funny to see a ham there instead of the fancy bath salts jars we always used for the myrrh and the frankincense. As for ruining the whole thing, it seemed to me that the herdmans had improved the pageant a lot just by doing what came naturally, like burping the baby, for instance, or, or thinking a ham would make a better present than a lot of perfumed oil. It's a great book. Read it if you get a chance. It makes the point that we all, like John the Baptist, like the people around him, we all know what is good and what is right. And truth be told, we really all want to see the good and right things happen, at least most of us. But we also know how far we are from bringing it about in our own lives, let alone in the world at large. The thing is that we also know, like John the Baptist knew, like Paul of Tarsus knew, like pretty much everybody knows, that while we can and must do our part, it takes more than is within us What we learn when we meet Jesus, whether as a baby, whether as the risen Lord, is that the final outcome, the final outcome of everything, rests on him and not on us. And that he makes things possible. that if left in our hands, would never be possible. John said to his, his people, I baptize you with water. The one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It's the light from that fire that Jesus brings, that we celebrate at this time of year and that is there to light our way all year round. It's a light that we need. It's a light 
about which a different John said, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never overcome it. I don't know about you. Speaking for myself, I need to hear that over and over and over again. And I need to share it over and over and over again. So thanks for listening. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior, and we pray for the full salvation of all who still wait for the good news that God is with us and that nothing can ever separate us from his love in you. Amen. is waiting to see the promised one and the open furrows the sowing of the lord heal the world bound and struggling seeks true liberty it cries out for justice and searches for the truth Thus says the prophet to those of Israel, A, a virgin mother will bear Emmanuel, For his name is God with us, our brother shall be. With him hope will blossom once more within our hearts. Mountains and valleys will have to be made plain. Open new highways, new highways for the Lord. He is now coming closer, so come all and see. And open the doorways as wide as wide can be. In lowly stable, the promised one appeared, yet feel his presence throughout the earth today, for he lives in all Christians and is with us now. Again, with his coming, he brings us liberty. Today, may you know the liberty, the freedom that is in Christ. Freedom from sin, freedom from fear. The liberty to reach out in love and in concern. Today, may you know the peace that is in him. A peace that passes all understanding and that keeps our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. And may the blessing of the Holy Spirit also be with us, now and ever. Amen.